I'd like to talk about the future of medicine. A future where breast cancer is rare, few women give it a thought. A time when we know how to prevent the disease. But first I have to tell you about the past and show you the present. In 1624, John Don wrote, Never send for whom the bell tolls, and tolls for thee. In his time, tolling was telling, announcing a death. Here, John, here Don is saying, we're all connected, you and I. Each one of us is, is connected. Every death is our death. So why am I quoting a 17th century <clears throat> English poet and to talk about breast cancer? Because this tolling is breast cancer. Every toll, every bell, announcing that somewhere in the world a woman's being diagnosed with breast cancer. Two million women a year, one woman every 15 seconds, 40 while I'm speaking here today. A mother, a daughter, a sister, an aunt. Uh, as young as 25, as old as you can imagine. <clears throat> every race, every ethnicity. Bell tolls for queens and for Nobel laureates. Uh, and for the woman next door with three children. Every toll, change, a life changed forever. Every bell marking the moment a woman is told, you have breast cancer. It's an ancient disease. 24 centuries ago, Queen Atosa, the wife of Darius the Great, had breast cancer. Her slave used a, a fire iron, a hot poker, to remove her breast. I recently visited India where women wait, <clears throat> excuse me, where women wait hours for a precious few minutes with their doctor. We do research with a professor at the Karolinski Institute in Sweden, a place that awards the Nobel Prizes, where precision medicine is performed. But regardless of these differences, cancer treatment is pretty much the same everywhere. It's what people call cut, burn, and poison. First, a surgeon cuts the tumor. Remember Queen Atosa? A hundred years ago, we removed the entire breast. Now we just take a lump, the cancer, and we call that progress. Then we burn the patient with radiation to kill any leftover cells. A hundred years ago, it was the entire torso. <clears throat> it damaged the heart, burned the skin, a, a fire without flames. Now AI directs the radiation. We have reduced collateral damage, but not no damage, not no heart effects. And we call that progress. And finally, we poison the patients with chemo to kill any escaping cells. Quick je jeopardy question. If the answer is the deadly poisons used in World War I, what we now call WMDs, what's the question? Where did cancer chemotherapy come from? Initially, more women died of the treatment than lived. <clears throat> now we just kill a part of the patient. Usually her immune system, she's bald, enters menopause. And we call that progress. It is progress of a sort. It's incremental, baby steps. A slow process of better and better cancer treatment, stretching out into the future. I have a different vision. I don't want better cancer treatment. I want to prevent breast cancer. I want a future where breast cancer doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Imagine that future with me. Two million women a year never hear the words, you have cancer. The cut, burn, and poison warriors, they're out of business. Where nobody has to be scared because their mother had breast cancer, thinking, when is it their turn? Maybe not getting married, not having children, all because of something that might happen in the future. Remember the decision Angelina made? She's famous, wealthy, can have the best care available. She is at increased risk of breast cancer, so what did she do? She had a bilateral mastectomy. Not because she had cancer, but because someday, in the distant future, she might. For all these reasons, about a decade ago, I, I began to try to change the paradigm of breast cancer, to transform it. My hope was that I could rely on the prevention of breast cancer's cousin, cervical cancer. The biology between the two is interrelated. If something works in one, it very well would work in the other. As you know, the foundation of cervical cancer prevention is the pap smear. 
named after the Greek American doctor, George Papanikolov, who developed it. A test that reduced cervical cancer by 90%, leading to a vaccine that now is the ultimate way to prevent the disease. And this was the success I, I hope to achieve with breast cancer. I remember the day I started. I was in a medical library down in the basement, down where the, the dusty old journals were, looking for a paper from 1958 that Do Dr. George Papanikolov had, had written. It turns out that after he, after he developed his cervical cancer test, he went on to try to develop a pap smear for breast cancer. He had invented a, a small suction device that collected fluid from the nipple he could put under the microscope. As I read his paper, my excitement grew. He was able to diagnose breast cancer with, in women who had no lumps, no signs, no symptoms whatsoever, just like the cervical pap smear. And then he wrote, unfortunately, I collect a specimen in only about 20% uh, of women. Most women don't produce any cells at all. Well, a screening test that works in one in five women is useless. That's why his paper was down in the basement of the library. But I remember thinking, if I could come up with a way to develop a device that would collect fluid in every woman, and then a medicine that would, re would reverse the precancerous changes, that one-two punch could transform breast cancer. This mental image became my Polaris, my North Star. It guided my work. Every day I imagined a, a future where breast cancer entered the history books, just like cervical cancer. But first I needed to figure out why his device didn't work. I had a theory. My hunch was that he had actually collected fluid in every woman, but, but sometimes it was just so small he couldn't see it. So I made a minor modification in his, in his device. I put a membrane in contact with the nipple that could wick fluid, even the tiniest amount of fluid. We made the device, we tested it, and it worked. We got fluid in most women. We continued our work, and by 2014, we, had, we were offering this test for patients. We had crossed the finish line, or so we thought. Spoiler alert. This is where my two steps forward ends. <laughs> Soon after we launched the test, the FDA arrived, wanting to see our records. This was the beginning of the end for us. They didn't like what they saw. They had wanted reams of data before we offered the test clinically. Within a year, we had taken the test off the market. We had hit a brick wall, and now I'd lost my one ability to watch cancer develop under the microscope. I needed another signal that, would, that I could follow that, that allowed me to watch cancer develop. Uh, I, I couldn't go through a wall at this point in time, but I could pivot and go through a door in a different wall. It turns out another test had been developed that acted like my aspirate test. Identified women at high and low risk of breast cancer. Uh, changed if a woman lowered her risk. It's called the breast density test. The higher your density, the wider your mammogram, uh, the higher your risk of, of breast cancer. It's almost as if the cervical pap smear under the microscope and the breast density changes by mammography were measuring the same underlying biology, just with, with different tools. So, for example, you can lower your risk of breast cancer about 15% by doing three things. Exercise, reduce weight, uh, reduce alcohol. What do these have in common? They all lower your estrogen, which is a major driver of breast cancer. All three also reduce the density. This test works. So these lifestyle changes, in fact, are a way that you can be smart if you're dense. So having a way to now monitor the changes in, in, breast, in, in the breast before you get cancer how do we leverage that for prevention? Well, it turns out there's already a, a drug that does both. It lowers density and prevents breast cancer. In a one-year study, uh, it significantly, re it significantly redu reduced density. Five years later, density was, uh, breast cancer was prevented in 63% of the women. The paradigm of Measure density, take pill, prevent cancer, worked. 
So are we there yet? Not quite. Not quite. While this pill did prevent breast cancer, it had very serious, unacceptable side effects. Take a 30, 40-year-old year old woman, give her this pill for a week, and she becomes menopausal. She starts having hot flashes, night sweats. This, uh, we, we hit another, another brick wall, another setback. But for the second time, we think we found a way forward. There are 23 chemicals made by this drug in the body. My, my theory, my hope, was that I could separate the prevention effects from among these 23 from, the, from the, the bad side effects. We tested that theory, and it turned out to be correct. Only one chemical out of all 23 was responsible for the benefit. We've made a, a pill from that, and we're undergoing testing. And if successful, it, it might be available soon in the future. Over a decade ago, I asked a simple question. Why isn't there a pap smear for breast cancer? I started down a path to create one, had some setbacks, but found a way forward. And now we're on a new path that's, that, 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 that looks promising. Someday, we may be able to answer the question, for whom the bell tolls, it tolls no more.